Amen. You don't know what you're living for until you know what you're willing to die for. When we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, aren't you thankful that not only did he live 33 and a half years on this earth, tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin, but he was also willing to die for us. And the greatest decision any person can ever make is the decision to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. The emphasis from Genesis to Revelation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord knows exactly where we are in each moment of our life. God knows exactly where you are in this moment. He knows exactly the condition of your heart. He knows not only your present state, but he knows your eternal state. The Bible teaches us that when I become a child of God, I am just as much in God's presence in heaven in this moment as I am on this earth. Once I'm saved, I'm always saved. I'm a child of God. There's nothing that will ever change that. The moment that I got saved was the moment that I received eternal life. And so the Lord knows our condition. He knows right where we are in this moment. He knows where we are in preparation for eternity. And this morning, I believe with all my heart that God has brought us together today around his word to not just, just, just to, not to deal with a, a, a moment but to deal with eternity. God desires to deal with your eternal state. He desires to deal and have you consider where you will spend eternity. John chapter number seven, John chapter number seven, and we've been through the entire book of John so far, all the way up through chapter six. Uh, we've been through chapter six of the book of John so far, and we get into chapter number seven, and uh, you'll find that in the latter part of the Gospel of John, the last few chapters are designated to the last few moments of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're de designated to the last few days that he would spend on this earth and the impact and influence that he had. And, and so John kind of skips around a little bit, but you'll notice from John 1 all the way through where we will be this morning, there was always a conflict. There was always the world that wrestled against the Savior. There was always wrong that was against right. There was always good against evil. And the Lord Jesus Christ is emphasizing this. And I would say to us this morning that that has not changed. There's always a battle between right and wrong. There's always a battle between good and evil. There's a battle between what we should and what we should not do. And the Lord brings us to this passage in John 7. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. I'm going to skip a few verses and skip around a little bit, so stay with me. But in John chapter number 7, verse number 1, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewelry, because the Jews sought to kill him. You'll remember that from the previous chapters they were after the Lord. They sought to take his life. They, they did not like the fact that the Messiah, that Jesus Christ, that this Messiah was not the king they expected him to be. And so they sought to kill him. And, his, and now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. And then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto, the fe unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. And when he had said these things, said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up into the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? They were looking for Jesus. There was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man, and others said, Nay, 
but he deceived the people. By the way, both of them were wrong. Jesus Christ was more than a good man. He was the Savior of the world. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Skip down with me, if you would please, in verse number 20. And the people answered and said, I'm sorry, skip down with me to verse number 16. And Jesus said unto them, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? And the people answered and said, Thou hast the devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses there gave, for, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but because of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcised a man. If a man on the Sabbath day received circumcision, then the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Verse 25, they seek to kill him again. Skip down if you would, please. In verse number 28, then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Down verse 33, please. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while, and I am with you. Then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, ye shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. I want you to look at verse number 33, where Jesus makes this statement. He said unto them, yet a little while. I want to preach on that thought this morning, just a little while. Let's pray. Lord, I need your help this morning. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts. I pray that you would speak to us. May you challenge us. Lord, help me to simply focus on the words that you once said. And Lord, may nothing else be said. May you be honored and glorified. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. A little while. I remember being a young kid growing up and uh, asking my mom many times on trips, how long before we get there? And her response sometimes when it was a little longer than maybe she wanted to let on, it'll be just a little while. It'll be just a little while. I remember we would go to my grandparents who lived in Statesboro, which was about an hour away. And our, all of us, my brother, my sister, and I would always say, are we closer to home or closer to Granny's? Are we closer to home or closer to Granny's? We would make it to 144 and 17 here in Richmond Hill. And we would say, are we closer to home or are we closer to Granny's? Sometimes we are impatient people, aren't we? Someone said that people pray for patience, but they always pray to have it now. We want what we want now. And the truth is that when we think about life, many of us sometimes think we know what we want. We think we know what we need. And, and sometimes all of us can determine what's best for our life without considering the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me what I want. Give it to me now. Someone once said that all of God's choicest servants had one thing in common, humility. The life that we live is not about us and what we want, but it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that reflection here in this passage of Scripture when Jesus said to this group that was questioning him, it's not of me, but it's of him that sent me. Aren't you thankful that we have somebody much greater than you and I that sent us, that we belong to, that we're attached to? I'm glad that the God that we serve is not one of many gods. He's not one of uh, a few gods, but he is the only God. He is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And I'm attached to him by name. I'm one of his children. What I do and what you do should be a reflection. We should understand that that is always a reflection upon the Lord Jesus Christ. When we think about this, this phrase, just a little while, we try to put it in, in time. We, 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 we describe it, it's defined by time. Well, how much time? 
The Bible tells us in Job that man born a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Well, that word few is a relative term, isn't it? Because some, some days are, uh, seem a lot longer than others and some days go by much quicker than others. And the fact is, when we look at life, it passes so quickly, doesn't it? It's like a vapor that's here for a little time. The Bible says in James, then it vanisheth away. How many of you can agree with that statement, life passes quickly? Remember when you were growing up and you thought, I'll never get my driver's license? And now you pay the insurance every month and you wish you didn't have driver's license. <laughs> life passes quickly. I remember being a young man. I was 20 years old. My wife and I got married and I remember not knowing anything. I didn't know a lot, but I knew, Brother Jim, I didn't know anything. <laughs> we got married and our children began to come along and begin to come along and begin to come along. And, <laughs> and I remember being young, and some of you are in that place right now when, when we had three in diapers at one time. And we were trying to figure out what day it was. We were trying to figure out if we were going to make it through the end of the week, if we were going to make it through the end of the day without killing one another. And we, those kids came along, and man, it was life was just, man, it was a whirlwind. And, and now we look back in those days, they passed quickly. Just a little while. You may be here this morning, you say, Pastor Ryan, I've never been married, and, and I have my driver's license, and, and boy, time just seems to be, Going by so slow, can I remind you, the Bible says it's just a vapor. Psalmist said, we spend our years as a tale that is told. It's just a little while. And in that little while that we've been given, that, that little moment that we've been given, that little blurb, if you would, on the screen called life, in that little while that God has given us, and that little while is described in, as life, it's defined as life, in that little while, what are you going to do for Jesus? That little bit that the Lord has given you, that little moment of time God has given you called life, what is it that you're going to do for the Lord? Jesus Christ here is, is in his earthly ministry is dealing chapter after chapter, verse after verse with those who do not believe, with those who want to question, with those who are trying to catch him, with those who are trying to trip him up, if you will. And in the moment they've been given called life, they're wasting time. Just a little while. I want you to write three words down this morning as we think about this time, this little while that we've been given. Number one, write down the word testimony. Write down the word testimony. I want you to see the emphasis that Jesus places on not only our testimony, we find that in Scripture, whether therefore we eat or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Jesus places an emphasis we find over and over again on our testimony, but he also does that because he emphasizes his testimony. Look what the Bible says in verse number 6, if you would please. He says, and then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. We know that Jesus is referring to that time when he would be, be revealed as the Savior of the world, the true Messiah, when he would go to the cross and die for our sin, when, when he would expose himself, if you would, to the world as the true and living Savior. But the Bible tells us here that he is reminding these disciples again in verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hated, but it hateth me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. You see, when you begin to shine just a little light into a dark room, and Brother Holmes made mention of this on last week, but if you took and turned all the lights out in the room and turned on just a little light, it begins to expose the darkness. Every one of us have a testimony. You see, our testimony is what other people see about us. 
Your testimony is what other people see about you. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, sirs, we would see Jesus. May our prayer be that may everyone around us see Jesus. May people see Christ in us. There's a song that goes, may they see Jesus in you. Our prayer is that everyone around us would see Jesus in us. Can I confess to you? There are days that people don't see Jesus in Brian Cooper. And there are probably days that people don't see Jesus in you. We have a testimony, a testimony that, that, that either points people to Christ or, or it, it drives them from the Lord Jesus. But the Bible tells us here that Jesus says we need to be aware of our testimony. And in this world, people aren't going to like you when you're attached to Jesus. Our testimony is what people see about us, but our character is what God knows about us. You see, if you never love God privately, you'll never stand for God publicly. Somebody says, well, I'm struggling in my Christian life. And it's interesting to me today how easy it is for Christians to be more comfortable participating and being attached to and identifying. That's a word we like to use today, right? Identifying with the world rather than Jesus. And Jesus said, if you'll be ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father, which is in heaven. Why is it that so many of us as Christians are content to live a life that is acceptable and pleasing and, and, and comfortable with a world that we have just a little while with? Rather than a God we're going to spend eternity with. Our testimony. What is it that people see about you? So, well, Pastor Brian, I don't care what people say about me. And I, can I tell you, I get that way sometimes. How many of you get that way? Well, I don't care. You know, when I get that way, it's when I'm carnal. <laughs> I'm not following the spirit. I'm following the flesh. I don't care what they think. The truth of the matter is, is I'm a sermon and somebody's reading it. We, we oftentimes think about ourselves. Not only do we not care, but we think no one else cares. Until we stop doing what we're supposed to be doing and we realize how much influence we have. There's a testimony. Jesus said of his testimony, he said, the world doesn't hate you. They hate me and they hate you because you're attached to me. He said, the world hates me. We, we need to be very careful. Can I, can I give us some help this morning? Everybody with me today? I know it's Sunday morning. But we need to be very careful about things that do not align with biblical truth being accepting of who we are. There's a dangerous path we're beginning to walk down. There's a dangerous door. Well, you know, I, I want everything to love. I want everybody to love me. And I want everything to love me. And I want, I want to just be a part of everything. There's some things as a child of God, you cannot be connected to and be right with God. It's not time in this world in which we're living, the, the little while that we've been given uh, to, to uh, just sit back and allow the world to dictate a culture. Friend, we must understand we have a responsibility as a church, as Christians, to not be influenced, but to impact the world around us, to point out the sin in lives, not to, not to, not to proclaim them. To point out the depravity that's in man, not to cover it up. To point out the corruption that lies within all of our heart and not display just the rosy picture that no one cares about. To, to point out the true need of the world and not to ignore it. To point out the destiny of every man because there is an eternity that every person will spend. And you and I understand we only have a little while to have the right testimony. What people see about us. Secondly, I want you to write this word down. I want you to write the word down, hope. True hope is only found in Jesus Christ. As a, as, a, as a Christian with our testimony, we must be wise to the actions of our life. What you do matters. Where you go matters. Your presence matters. Your participation matters. You ought to be wise to know that. You say, how do I, why do I struggle so often with doing the right things? Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We've got the wrong things on the inside. Therefore, the wrong things are produced on the outside. We're to be wise. We think about our testimony and all. We're to be wise. We're to be watchful. 
Be careful what you attach yourself to. Be aware of your surroundings. And Jesus warns of this in verse number 16. Look what he tells us. He says, uh, verse 16, and Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but is, it is that, but it, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of my doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. There are so many things today that are cloaked and painted as religion that God has nothing to do with. I, I am, our church is involved in as much as it can be involved in being a help and an asset in our community in areas that need help. We've reached out to our public school systems. We've reached out to our community leaders and said, how can Bethel Baptist Church be helpful and be a light in this community? We had just recently this storm that went through the northern part of our county and our church jumped right in to try to be a help and a blessing and we're able to do some things that would be helpful. And I'm grateful that we're able to do that. But understand this. Giving water to people won't change their eternity. Giving somebody something to eat won't change their eternity. And we are so comfortable being connected to all those things. But when we must approach the gospel, isn't it interesting how often we cower? You see, the greatest thing that people ought to know about you is who you are for Jesus. We ought to be watchful. We ought to be aware. We ought to be warned. We ought to be warned. Our testimony in a moment, we can destroy what it's taken a lifetime to build. What you believe is the basis of how you behave. Our testimony. Then we come to the word hope. Look in verse 22. The Bible says in verse number 22, he says, uh, verse, uh, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because of because it is of Moses, but because of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcised a man. If a man on the Sabbath day received circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I've made man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus reflects back in this discussion he's having with the religious crowd here. He's saying, listen, you can look back at the law, but the law's never going to justify you. The law's never going to make you whole. The law law is never going to produce in you, Jesus said, what I can produce in you. He said, you look to the laws of man. You look to the laws of Moses He said, and in a moment, I can make you whole. The Bible tells us that so often we we are looking at a a culture and a world that looks for hope in so many places. They're trying to find hope in different relationships. They're trying to find hope in a certain addiction. They're trying to find hope in the bottom of a bottle. They're trying to find hope in a different agenda. They're trying to find hope in a different purpose. They're trying to find hope in turning over a new leaf. And Jesus says, without me, there is no hope. We live in that moment we call just a little while, that little time that the Lord has given us. And in that moment, I want you to know there's hope. You say, what's the message of the church? Well, the message of the church is what it has been from Genesis to Revelation. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the gospel, people find hope. I mean, if you sitting here in this room this morning understand that without Jesus, before Jesus found you, that you were in a hopeless situation, that we were without Christ. But because of him, there's hope. We have just a little while to have a testimony for Christ. We have just a little while to share the message of hope. You and I would be more faithful at sharing sharing the message of hope if we realize that it is the same hope that motivates us. Look what the Bible tells us in in verse number 37. He says, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, that ought to stir the heart of every Christian. I'm so thankful that anybody that comes to the Lord that thirsts can come unto him and the Lord would give him drink. As a matter of fact, if you take your Bibles and turn back just a few chapters to John chapter number four, you'll find in John chapter four, verse uh, in chapter number four, we find this Samaritan woman and she was struggling with the same issue. 
Verse number 10 says, If thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. He would have given thee living water. Verse number 13 says, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into ever." lasting life. You see, the thing that motivates the Christian is the difference that Jesus has made in our life. The thing that causes us to want to share the message of hope is the difference that Jesus Christ has made in us. Listen to me. Understand something. That without Him we were lost and undone. There was no answer to our problems. I don't care how good you are, how many times you've attended church, how many Bibles you own, but if you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, you are living condemned already, the Bible said. But there's a message of hope. And God's people must be motivated by that message because the Bible says that when we take a drink of the living water, it's a a well springing up into everlasting life. You can always go to the well and be reminded of the water that Jesus gave you. It ought to motivate us. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? On a daily basis, we are to consider the thought, where would we be without Jesus? Look at the difference Christ has made in us. So often in our culture, we want to remove the importance of the gospel. We want a list. We want a a different plan, a different opportunity to, to see all of this played out in our life we want to be a better husband or we want to be a better wife or we we want to have a stronger family but we're trying to accomplish that without Jesus and I'm telling you you've got just a little while just a little while and that opportunity will be gone how many times have we said you know what I'm going to get that taken care of I'm going to do that I'm going to I'm going to be what I ought to be, but I'm going to do that later. Until we get so consumed by life, we get into the the will, the cogs of life, and it just continues to roll on and we don't even have any control over it. Hope. Just a little while, testimony. Just a little while to share hope. And we have just a little while, thirdly, write this word down, promise. What does Jesus tell us? Look in verse 33 of chapter 7 again. John 33, verse number 7. The Bible tells us that Jesus speaking says that and Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while, and I am with you. And then I go unto him that sent me. And ye shall seek me. And ye shall not find me. Whether I am, thither ye cannot come. In the context of Scripture here, Jesus is speaking of His ascension back to the Father. We know in this moment He is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding for you and for me. Just as much faith, it requires just as much faith in our life to trust God as our personal Lord and Savior. It requires faith, just as, just as it requires faith to trust the Lord as our, our personal Savior, it requires faith to live as if we believe Jesus is coming again. Amen. The context is that Jesus is now getting ready to ascend to the right hand of the throne of God. But friend, I want to remind you that He's not going to stay there. Amen. He's not stuck there, if you will. How many times in your life and in my life do we get stuck in certain places? I just feel stuck. I feel like I can't get victory. I feel like I can't get over this hill. I can't get past this or beyond this. Maybe it's hurt or heartache or some struggle in your life. And and you feel like I'm just stuck there. And, And every time you try to make a little advance, the devil pushes you right back to that moment. And you just seem to be stuck on it. I remember growing up when I was a a teenage boy and I played sports and this was back when coaches could coach without getting in trouble, you know. And uh, sometimes the coach would say, hey, man, you just got to suck it up a little bit. You got to get over it sometimes. There are always bad things that happen to good people. Read the Bible. You'll find it over and over again. But that doesn't change who God is. 
Jesus is saying to this, this group, hey, I'm only going to be here for just a little while. And he, he told his disciples a little later on in John, he said, I have to go away. And he said, if I don't go away, the comforter cannot come. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Spirit this morning? Aren't you thankful that when the word of God is open and the Bible is preached, that the Holy Spirit flares up in our life and it produces that joy. He produces that joy and that satisfaction that we can always find in Jesus. But he gives us a promise and we find it in verse number 33. Hey, yet a little while. I am with you. Yet a little while I'm with you, then I go unto him that sent me. He gives us the promise of eternal life. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He tells us in verse 37 again, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, in the script, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. God has promised us eternal life. Listen, many people claim to preach a religious message, but there is only one gospel. There's only one message of truth. There's only one way to heaven. There are not many ways. I'm sorry, friend, but if you don't believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin and you're trusting anything else, whether it's anything else plus Jesus, you're not trusting Christ. There's one way to heaven. And Jesus said, you must drink of the water that I give if you desire eternal life. I think it was B.R. Lakin that said we would be surprised by the number of people who sit in churches every week that have never truly trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. They're holding on to their religion. They're holding on to their actions. They're holding on to their, 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 their service. And, and all of these things are, are products of, of what they believe that will produce heaven one day in their life. And the fact is, you must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm warning you this morning because you have just, just a little while. Just a little while. There's the promise of eternal life. And secondly, there's the promise of ended opportunities. Do you understand that every person in this room will hear their last sermon one day? Every person in this room will go to work for the last day. We'll sit down to dinner with our families for the last time. We'll, we'll sit and, and enjoy moments with those that we love for the last time. There is coming an end. And every one of us must face it. Jesus said, I, I, I'm going away. I, I'm here just a little while. Can I remind you, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, you have just a little while. That life that's passing so quickly, Jesus said, in the moment that you've been given, listen, live. Someone said it this way, life is preparation for eternity. And he said, live life preparing to stand before the Lord. Live the life that you've been given, understanding that we're going to stand before God with the opportunity that he handed us. And did opportunities. How sad it would be for someone to sit in a church service like this. Hear a sermon about the time that we've been given and the testimony that you have and the hope that is in Jesus and walk out and never do anything about it and it be the last time that you're given. I'm so grateful for all that the Lord is doing and how God is working. I'm thankful for how God's blessed and how God's Met needs far beyond what we deserve. How God's worked in your life and God's worked in my life. And I look around and I see the people that God has brought to this place to serve Him. And I think, what a blessing it is. But at some moment, we're going we're to have the last service. You're going to sit in the last sermon. Just a little while. What are you going to do with the opportunity you're given? Jesus 
as he always did, brought the discussion, he brought the conflict, he brought the questioning, he brought the, the, the entrapment, if you will. He always brought it back to the same place. You have to deal with Jesus. What are you going to do with the little while you've been given? Just a little while. You have to choose. You have to choose today. You say, I don't have to choose today. No, you're making a choice. In this moment. Lord, I love you today.